Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second session of our spring lecture series here at STM. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Natalia Imperatori Lee from the Mary Field and Vincent D. P. Gabot Lecture on Women's Contributions to Church and Society. Dr. Imperatori Lee received her undergraduate degree from Fordham University, her master's from the University of Chicago, and her PhD from Notre Dame. She serves as department chair and professor of religion at Manhattan College. Her research interests focus on Catholic ecclesiology, in particular, the intersection of ecclesial identity with feminist and Latinx Catholic thought. Her 2018 book, Quentheme, explores how narrative shape ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. She is also interested in the relationship between Mariology and ecclesiology, intercultural theology, gender studies, and the relationship of women, the poor, and other marginalized groups to church structure and governance. She has contributed to the chapter, How is Amoris Letizia Being Received? Colonialism, Conscience, and accompaniment in the book, Amoris Letizia, A New Momentum for Moral Formation and Pastoral Practice. Dr. Imperatori Lee has also published several articles, including Father Knows Best, Theological Mansplaining and the Ecclesial War on Women, and Sin, Intimacy, and the Genuine Face of the Church, a response to Ormond Bush. Please help me to welcome Dr. Lee as she addresses the topic, Listen, what the hashtag Me Too can teach the Catholic Church. Good evening. Um, thank you all for having me here today. I'm especially grateful to Sister Jen for this invitation and to Yale Catholic Campus Ministry. Um, Many of my friends and colleagues started their careers here, and obviously it's a huge honor to be invited anywhere near here, um, especially if you went to somewhere like Notre Dame. I mean, come on. Um, I'm here to talk to you today, or tonight I should say, about topics that are sensitive and yet vital to the church's survival. I'll be talking about assault and abuse, and if these topics are difficult for you personally, I wanted you to be aware and that you should feel free to step away if you need to. I approach these topics from a feminist lens, and if that's a particularly difficult topic for you, then I invite you to stay, <laughs> and to stay with an open heart. Feminism had for many years become a kind of dirty word, and certainly not a word compatible with Christianity, and least of all with Roman Catholicism. But feminism is merely the belief that women are human beings made in the image of God. I approach feminism, I'm gonna to have to like slide over a couple of times, get it slide. Um, and so I'll be doing that, I apologize, it'll be a little jumpy. So I approach feminism from an intersectional lens, which has also recently become a popular scare word, though all it means is that I'm acknowledging in my analysis that racism, sexism, classism, and colonialism are all interconnected and intensify one another. As a light-skinned Latina, I reap the benefits of racial injustice even as I'm marginalized because of my sex and ethnicity. The topic of sexual violence is urgent. We see it all over the news, in secular and sacred media, in all kinds of institutions. And as Catholic Christians, we must ask ourselves if we have done enough, if we've paid enough attention, if we've cared enough about this violence to take the necessary steps to make it stop. A few weeks ago, Pope Emeritus Benedict issued a quasi-apology for his role in enabling the cover-up of sexual abuse when he was the ordinary in Munich. Survivor's advocates found his communique lacking in empathy and excessively legalistic. Late last year, oh. Late last year, the Survivor's Advocacy Organization Into Account released a YouTube video featuring 16 women who came forward with details of how the liturgical composer David Haas manipulated and abused them spiritually and sexually. Haas ran a camp for teenagers. He had particular special friendships with teens who caught his eye, and he memorized their 18th birthdays. That detail stuck with me. 
Many, many other survivors have come forward in a variety of contexts and detailing a harrowing amount of manipulation, coercion, and harassment. A horrifying report commissioned in early 2020 by the L'Arche community revealed that its founder, Jean Vanier, a hero to so many and someone who was hailed as a living saint for his work with adults who have mental disabilities, abused his power and preyed on women who came to him for spiritual direction. And this is the thing. Sooner or later, this news will come to light about someone you admired, regardless of your ideological slant. The founder of the Legionnaires of Christ, Marcial Maciel, abused young boys and seminarians. He fathered six children with four women, some of whom he went on to abuse as well. He was a rapist and a morphine addict. I'm sorry, this is not dinner conversation, but never, you know, we gotta get through it. He was a rapist, he was a morphine addict, he pushed drugs on seminarians and others in his circle. He was also hailed as an important fundraiser and a benefactor of the Roman Catholic Church and enjoyed the protection of Pope John Paul II for far too long. Pope Benedict removed Maciel, sentenced him to a life of penance and silence and put the legionnaires under new direction, but reports have confirmed that an abusive culture persists in this group with allegations of continuing harassment and cover-up, priests sent to ask survivors to lie, and settle for cash payouts, things like this. These are only the most visible stories. Headline-grabbing stories like these shouldn't obscure for us the banality and ubiquity, the everydayness of sexual abuse in our church. The Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report of August 2018 named more than 300 priest abusers and several priest enablers, or bishop enablers, I should say. The lists like it, coming from dioceses, religious orders, and now even lay organizations like L'Arche or publishing houses like GIA, make this abuse crisis seem endless. So why bring them up? It's such a painful, sinful part of church history. It calls into question much of the good the church has done. You certainly can't help but feel a little queasy about Catholic educational missions as a result of this. So why dwell on it? Because the very first step in learning from movements like Me Too and Church Too is to look at abusive cultures straight on. If we look away because we're squeamish or we don't want that kind of negativity or we're choosing to focus on the positive, we're effectively turning our backs on the suffering vulnerable people around us. And let's not make a mistake. In cultures that use authority and secrecy as currency, all of us are potentially vulnerable people. So, Let's set out some terms at the start. I'm talking about sexual abuse, assault, and harassment. These are not all the same thing, but they all flourish in similar cultures. In fact, some cultures are particularly receptive hosts to sexual misconduct that can vary from hostile work environments to child rape. Sexual assault is defined as sexual contact that occurs without the explicit consent of the victim. 80% of these are committed by someone known to the victim. Sometimes this is couched in euphemisms like non-consensual sex. The word for that in English is rape. Sexual abuse of children refers to any kind of sexual contact with a child since children cannot consent to sexual activity of any kind. Sexual harassment encompasses a variety of behaviors that range from unwanted sexual advances and the creation of a hostile work environment through lewd or targeting comments all the way to rape or assault in the workplace. These are not all the same crime. They don't all carry the same punishments. What they have in common is the likelihood that perpetrators will get away with it. It is notoriously difficult for victims to come forward, in large part because our justice system is not hospitable to survivors of sexual violence. We live in a culture of rape, which I used to think was just a hyperbolic, sensationalized way of talking, but really, Rape culture is just the assumption, and I think we were all raised with it to some extent. I was certainly, I was hit with it the other day when I sat down with my, I have a preteen son and a teenage son, and we sat down to watch um, Back to the Future. <laughs> have you watched Back to the Future lately? Don't. <laughs> it did not age well. It's this assumption, and if you watch Back to the Future again, you'll see it, that given the opportunity, <laughs> Men will assault women sexually, period. Men have uncontrollable drives and women must take steps. They're obligated to take steps in order to prevent harm to themselves. That's rape culture. That we assume that this is how men are. 
or that this is just how the world is, that the world sort of tends toward rape, so we need to put guardrails in place, like carrying mace, or learning self-defense, or not jogging at night, or not jogging with headphones. I'm sure some of you have done these things. Because to make oneself vulnerable is to invite the inevitable. That inevitability, or the feeling of inevitability, is the normalization of assault. And that is a culture of rape. Activist Tarana Burke, who you could see here, coined the phrase Me Too in 2006 to bring attention to the pervasiveness of sexual harassment women face in the workplace and in the world at large. The phrase became part of our national lexicon in 2017 when it began trending on Twitter, accompanying women's stories of harassment and assault. It grew like a tsunami of horror. Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Juno Diaz, Tavis Smiley, Charlie Rose. Charlie Rose? I mean, isn't PBS supposed to be a kind of bastion of culture? I don't know. When I was growing up in Miami, I always assumed it was the height of Americanness. Right? You've really made it in this country when you're getting your news from PBS. And yet, it turns out that PBS is filled with predators too. And like the Catholic cases I referenced above, those are just the headline grabbers. The real headline is all the women who raise their hands in recognition. Oh, yeah. That definitely has happened to me. Or, oh, of course, I've had employers make sexual comments or touch me inappropriately or have somebody holler at me on the street. Oh, yeah. Someone in a position of power over me has made comments about my body or about my personal life. I remember being struck by the amount of men who had disrobed in their offices during the workday. I thought, my god. I didn't realize how, much, how common it was for this to happen. I had no idea we needed a rule about this. You know? How did, why, how can they not know that walking around your office unclothed is pretty much appalling behavior? Women have been here before. In the conscious, consciousness raising groups of the 1960s and 70s, women were seeing their experiences of invisibility, of harassment, played out by their friends and neighbors. Early feminists of this period referred to the sense of recognizing your own experience in the shared narratives of another as a feminist clique. Jewish theologian Judith Plaskow, my former colleague at Manhattan College, refers to the yeah, yeah moments of meetings of women graduate students right here at Yale. That feeling of hearing someone complain about something that you thought was just a part of life, like getting referred to as sugar, or asked to refill the coffee, or passed over for a promotion because you were just gonna have kids anyway, of being invisible at work, or doing a double shift, yeah. Yeah, that happens to me, yeah, I also feel that way. In those gatherings, something clicked for women. It was that click that broke through isolation and into something like solidarity. Oh, so that wasn't just me. I didn't bring this on myself because I'm not assertive enough or because I don't I give off a vibe. It turns out that the supervisor is doing the same things to my coworkers. And once I realize that, I don't have an isolated problem. I have solidarity with those who share my problem. And together, we have a movement. The consciousness raising that gave rise to second wave feminism helped white, middle, and upper class women secure important rights like the holding of money in bank accounts and credit cards in their names and the normalization of working outside the home, some recognition of the labor involved in caring for children and families and households. But that movement left many women behind. Writer and activist Sarah Ahmed refers to a different kind of feminist sound, not a click, but a snap. Like a branch on a tree, she says, women who are derided, harassed, raped, silenced, and disbelieved eventually get to a point where they snap. The snap is loud, and women who snap raise a stink. They demand to be noticed. They demand justice. But more often than not, particularly in the case of women of color who suffer marginalization on the base of their sex and their race and their economic class, these women are viewed as problematic, as prima donnas, as demanding troublemakers who are difficult. Why? Because we hear the snap, but we never consider the pressures, the indignities, the harassment that bent that branch until it could no longer bear the weight. We should think very seriously about how often our cultures focus on the snap as being violent and not on all the abuse that bent and bent and bent that branch as a pre-existing violence, a first violence, as Gustavo Gutierrez would refer to um, in the case of poverty. So 
Some women clicked, and some women yeah, yeah, here at Yale, and some snapped, and now many of us have said, me too. The common ground to these sounds is the emergence after initial light bulb moment of solidarity of the unifying power of experience that prompts us to work for justice. That's not a terrible definition for the church, if you think about it. The same year Me Too was trending, a Nashville-based poet, Emily Joy, added her own hashtag to the mix. Her hashtag was called Church Too. She wanted to bring attention to how Protestant pastors, evangelical pastors in her specific case, groomed young people for assault through youth programs, etc. And this may sound familiar. Her hashtag and the wave of reaction to it revealed how predators select and prepare victims through seemingly innocuous channels like youth groups, mentoring, etc. Even theologian Emily Reimer Berry has surmised that the way we catechize children with an emphasis on obedience of, to authority and the secrecy of the confessional, along with the attendant shame about sin, might be laying the groundwork for abuse. Everything is so broken. The problem seems to be so deep-seated in our institutions and in our culture that it can seem hopeless. Further, it seems that the tendency towards sexual assault is not confined to the Catholic Church or the business world, both of which tend to be organized hierarchically, since abuse flourishes in church communities that are organized presbyterally or conciliarly or charismatically. Abuse and harassment flourish in Hebrew schools and in the Boy Scouts, at PBS and NBC, in urban and in rural areas. Predators exist and seek access to children and other targets. It is one of the most terrifying things about parenthood. I speak from experience there. Predators don't look creepy, which is one reason why they are successful. So let's turn our attention now to three other factors that contribute to abuse-tolerant organizations and abuse-enabling cultures and what we can do in terms of next steps. Many of my students, family, and peers wish we could just move on from this current constant talk of sexual abuse, harassment, and assault. Moving on can sometimes mean walking away or changing the channel, and that's very tempting. But in order to move on as followers of Christ, we must not look away from suffering or watch something else. Moving on for the church will involve at least three confrontations, with misogyny, with secrecy, and with shame. In other words, it's time to have serious conversations about sexism, clericalism, and sexuality in this church and beyond. Only by moving through this desert can we emerge on the other side transformed. So let's start by confronting misogyny. Misogyny is not a word I heard a lot growing up. I don't know if you did. It sounded extreme, or at the very least, implausible. Hatred of women isn't really something you can pinpoint on a person, right? We hear it more frequently now, but I fear it gets confused with regular old sexism or even discrimination. Philosopher Kate Mann, um, she's at Cornell, I believe, has written a magisterial work on misogyny called Down Girl. If any of you have read it, I mean, really good, life-changing. In it, she reorients our understanding of misogyny away from our feelings, like hatred, which are first impossible to quantify and secondly located in the person doing the hating, and so they depend on the person's self-reporting or self-awareness. For man, and I'm quoting here, misogyny should be understood as the law enforcement branch of a patriarchal order, which has the overall function of policing and enforcing its governing ideology. It is, in other words, not something psychological in the person who may or may not hate women, right? Oh, but he loves his sister. Oh, but he had a mom but rather an action, right? Misogyny is a thing done, a punishment felt. Not all women feel the punishment, because after all, the police only interfere with women who get out of line. What is the line we're held to in patriarchy? Women are, for man, Kate Mann, expected to be, and I'm quoting here, men's attentive, loving subordinates. Does that sound familiar to you? What do you think of when you think of a good woman? Or better question, who are Catholics supposed to think of when we think of a good woman? Someone said it, thank you, Mary. <laughs> the saints, maybe, you know, few of whom are women, even fewer of whom are women who were ever married, and fewest of whom are women who were sexually active throughout their lives. Women who aren't good are therefore bad. Badness for a woman can mean a number of things, but overall, these offenses are classed as violations of the good standard. Not virginal enough, not deferential enough, not nurturing enough. 
Good womanhood has been presented to Catholic women almost entirely wrapped up in suffering. And this is actually a little tangent. Um, something that I discovered through my work in Latinx theology um, and the work of Evelyn Stevens, who's a sociologist who talks about Marianismo, right? Um, this this complement to machismo where Mary is held up as a standard, but all of good womanhood is wrapped up in sadness, right? A good woman and a sad woman are the same thing. A happy woman, it must be bad, right? So we're entirely wrapped up in suffering here. The Mater Dolorosa of the Pieta, the mother who frets for her son's sanity, the mother who gives birth silently in a barn or a cave or wherever, the mother who frets about her child lost in the temple. Of course, the, Mar the relationship between Mary and Jesus is unequal because he is fully divine and human. She is merely human and conceived without original sin. That this relationship has become a template for all male-female relationships, though, is the problematic through line in Catholic theology with which we must contend. The history of subjugating women in Christianity is not a mere accident, and it's not really all that temporary, and it's not something that we can easily brush away. While some scholars have made compelling cases for why Jesus was atypical in his treatment of women by accepting them as disciples equally, not condemning women in adultery or rape situations, the same cannot be said of Jesus' followers. The sexism in our theology and in our church history runs very deep, so I'm just going to give you some greatest hits. <laughs> They're not great. Um, Tertullian taught that each woman was another Eve, the devil's gateway through whom sin entered the world and because of whom the Son of God had to die. That's right, ladies. Augustine taught that men were in the image of God, but women were not, because women were aligned with the body and men with the spirit. Women were only in the image of God when taken together with a man. Aquinas, heartbreaker, taught that we were defective males. This is only one trifecta of the many, many, many ways in which the Christian tradition communicates women's inferiority and justified our subjugation. Most recently, we see this in the complementarian theology that comes from the Vatican since the pontificate of John Paul II, if you'll forgive the cartoonish um, slide. Complementarity is the belief that men and women are two halves of a whole, think of Augustine here, and that the gifts of each complement the other. Now that sounds beautiful and very romantic, and it still is February in case we're still kind of riding high on that Valentine thing, and maybe like a lovely part of God's design. After all, it is based on the genital, com the biological, right, genital complementarity of women and men. Not to deny that biological complementarity, but let's ask ourselves if biological complementarity necessarily implies psychological complementarity. What about social complementarity, academic? Complementarity? Employment complementarity? One crucial flaw in complementarian thinking is that it takes biological assumptions about sexual intercourse, namely that it is always done one way, and turns that into an entire social order where men are initiatory and aggressive and women are receptive and nurturing. So we get women's special nature and vocation to motherhood, spiritual and otherwise. We have no similar documentation of men's nature or men's vocation because it is either assumed or left wide open with possibility. Hmm. Receptive and nurturing. Where have we heard that before? Oh. Women are to be men's attentive, loving subordinates. Let's remember that misogyny assigns to women very important, even crucial roles. We are, after all, necessary for the propagation of the species. And this is indeed very special, right? I'm a mom, I get it. But being made to feel special is not the same as being given the freedom of self-determination. A pedestal is its own prison. Sometimes when I read the pains that papal documents or Vatican documents go to to emphasize the special, necessary nature of women's voices, the need to protect women from clericalization or from the messiness of work outside the home or of politics, quite frankly, I want to scream. It's a template for misogyny, a how-to in terms of becoming an attentive, loving servant. And honestly, have you ever lived through norovirus with children? You know, noroviruses, stomach viruses? I'm really hitting you with all the greatest hits during dinner. Um, anyway, if you haven't, 
I can tell you that women, least of all mothers, do not require protection from messiness. And we've never gotten it, right? There's nothing messier than parenting. We are mired in mess, which is what the complementarian thinking will not allow. In this vision of perfect complementarity between husband and wife, between Christ and the church, the perfection glosses over reality. That two-parent households, where the mom stays home to care for the kids, have always been the province of the white middle class and used as a cudgel to talk about the irresponsibility of non-white parents, for example. Complementarian theology is problematic because it relies on and perpetuates stereotypes, because it is essentially a template for misogynistic thinking by setting the parameters against which women will be judged, and maybe most damningly because it's not real. Real mothers cannot be nurturing all the time without depleting themselves. Real life is messy and ambiguous, and there are bills and layoffs, and sometimes women get very angry and aggressive. Sometimes they are not subservient or pleasant, and sometimes oh, they even initiate sex. Imagine that. So now let's confront shame. Just as we have to confront how deep the roots of misogyny go in our Christian tradition and all the ways in which the church has furthered the agenda of patriarchy and domination of women, these are sins of commission, I would think, we also have to look long and hard at a great sin of omission. We have reneged on our responsibility to teach young people about sexuality in productive or healthy ways. I've got a lot of stories here, and we can talk about them after if you want, because I teach a class on sexuality and the sacred in New York. And maybe it's because they're Irish, but most of my students were never told anything about sex by their parents. I hear the laughter, maybe some of you are Irish too. <laughs> their church painted sex almost exclusively through the lens of sin and therefore of shame. Even in a regular gen ed religion class, of which I teach a bunch, if you ask for an example of sin, you always always get premarital sex, abortion, and homosexuality. It's like the big three, right? They know they can name them. It, it's rote for them. Sometimes I think the contemporary gospel, at least the one believed by most Catholics, is contained in those three prohibitions, right? I know I'm a good Catholic if I don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. Roman Catholic teaching on sexuality remains rooted in Aristotelian notions of biology, where the male is the generative principle and the female is the receptive one, as we saw in the complementarian theology I was just talking about. Our church teaches that the only licit sexual expression occurs on the marriage bed of a heterosexual couple that does not use contraception of any kind. Outside of marriage, virginity and celibacy is expected and taught. In this country, purity culture has filtered in with an idealized notion of sexuality helped along by the popularity of the theology of the body. What we learn in high school, what I learned in high school about sexuality is when in doubt, don't. A complete sentence. Don't is the overarching theme. Don't be gay. Don't have sex before marriage. Don't masturbate. Don't have impure thoughts. Don't use contraception. Don't get pregnant. Don't have an abortion. Don't lose your virginity. Furthermore, where our notions of social morality, like Catholic social teaching, have since the 19th century been framed as principles for reflection, criteria for judgment, and guidelines for action, our sexual morality is still acts-based. That is, rather than principles, criteria, and guidelines that assume a moral agent capable of discernment in the complexity of historical circumstance, sexual teaching is still propositions from the past about procreation, for example, held up as absolute moral laws to be obeyed or disobeyed. Right? This is rooted in the penitentials. This is where our moral theology comes from. No moral agency or discernment needed when it comes to sex. No shades of gray, if you'll pardon the best-selling pun. With our money, we are able to discern the right course of action for ourselves, our family, and our world. With our bodies, we must be told to do because our consciences stop working. And what has that brought us? Humanae Vitae came out in 1968. That was a really long time ago. More than 90% of Catholic women of childbearing age use birth control. Did it bring more holiness? Or did it just drive people underground with their sex lives? The naming of homosexuality as intrinsically disordered happened in 1975 in Persona Humanae. Did that make fewer gay people? No. It drove them to hide their identities and then to leave the church, in some cases taking their families with them, and in others alienating them from the people they loved. Today, other than pre-Cana, we have very little forthright discussion about sexuality in Catholic circles, or we did, 
until the abuse crisis happened. And that's the thing. Abuse flourishes in cultures of secrecy and shame. Our sexual teachings are entirely shame-based. We hold up Mary, a literal impossible ideal, as a perpetual virgin and also a mother for girls to imitate. And so the failure is built in. Purity culture, as we instantiate it in Catholicism with our emphasis on abstinence and the sacredness of a sexuality that is not explored in any way before marriage, but should always be open to pregnancy, is toxic because purity is toxic. The Lutheran theologian and pastor, Nadia Bowles Weber, notes that we have confused purity with holiness. But purity is about preservation and separation from pollution, whereas holiness is about union with something, namely God. Other thinkers, like Ruth Everhart, and this is her, she's adorable, um, like Ruth Everhart, who studied the Me Too movement and the church's response to it, note that purity and virginity cultures are dangerous to young women in many ways. First, the most prized thing a woman has, her virginity, is something that can be taken for, from her by force without consent. Secondly, consent, which is a necessary part of sexual activity, is completely overlooked in cultures of purity and abstinence. Before marriage, consent is seemingly not allowed. And after, it is assumed. Everhart notes that the more conservative church cultures provide a seedbed for abuse. Homosexuality is taboo. Abstinence is the answer to all teen questions about sex. Modesty is paramount, and violations are virulently shamed. This drives all sexual activity into the realm of secrecy and shame, and that's a red carpet for abusers. I recently uh, reconnected, recently, like two years ago, reconnected with a friend from Miami um, who's a psychologist who works with, the, uh, with a diocese, I'm not gonna say which one, and he's worked with both seminarian admission screenings and with abusive priests and with survivors, along with many just you know, run-of-the-mill priests who want therapy. One thing he notices when we're talking one day um, about non-integrated sexual identities and how difficult those are to treat is that some men come to him and are incapable of even naming sexual things without resorting to euphemisms. They cannot bring themselves to use anatomically appropriate words for body parts or to speak about arousal in anything but veiled ways. How can we expect integrated people to emerge from climates where we cannot talk about sexuality or desire or sexual expression? How can we foster a culture of concern around the intimacy of sexuality if we can't even bring ourselves to say the words, if even the words are shameful? Even more devastatingly, how can we expect survivors to come forward when we have shrouded all genital activity, even abuse, as a unique source of shame? The pedestal applies here too. When we elevate sexual expression, like the theology of the body can do, to a quasi-liturgical thing, when we glorify marital sexuality as if it were a mystical experience in every instance, then we are trafficking in shame. Because real life doesn't work this way. We teach our young adults that sex is to be avoided, and then on their wedding night they are to what? Flip a switch and come to see sex as a defining feature of their marriage and an ultimate good? Talking about sex only through a lens of fear and shame, like purity, is toxic. And reducing sex to a contract where one party, usually the woman, can give or withdraw consent, like a candy machine, is not the answer either. What we need is an ethic, a sexual ethic of concern. Concern for self and other, concern for community, and concern for integrity. But instead of accompanying young people who are marrying later and later in life, through their biological sexual exploration, we leave them in this wilderness of shame and silence. That contributes to the abuse crisis, and forthright conversations about sexuality way before pre cana are an important start. So now let's confront secrecy and clericalism. I'm going to take a drink of water before we get there. Creating programs that start conversations about sexuality is an important investment in the future of our church and of the world. But that's not the only or even the immediate response that the sexual misconduct crisis calls for right now. Everhart gives us three indicators of a, of a potentially abusive church culture, and I'm quoting from her here. 
Any tight-knit faith community can become a breeding ground for abuse and secrecy, especially if it revolves around a charismatic leader, is reluctant to address issues of sexuality forthrightly, and is self-policed by an elite group, end of quote. Since we talked about the second factor already, the sexual, talking about sex forthrightly, let's focus now on one in three and have a serious conversation about clericalism. Clericalism is the cause du jour of the sexual abuse crisis. This belief that the clergy are exempt from human failing, are somehow superhuman, has deep roots in the Christian tradition, namely the notion of higher and lower states of life. Prior to Vatican II, and still in the minds of many Catholics, there are some states of life that are, well, holier than others. The priesthood, or consecrated virginity or religious life for women, was viewed as the highest state of life, the closest to God because it was the denial of physicality, namely of sexuality, since as far as I know, priests and nuns still eat. Is that true? OK, thanks. Um, the idea that physicality and bodiliness are not godly because God is pure spirit comes, as you know, from Christianity's fusion with Greek philosophy. But those of us who couldn't hack celibacy could be somewhat holy in the lay state. After all, this is when marriage was understood to be a haven for lust. Still one of my favorite definitions of marriage, like a garage, right, where you park your lust. It's fantastic. This Greek influence still lingers, and I'll prove it. What happens when you die? What goes to heaven when you die? Your soul, exactly. Not your body, it's gross. The abuse and cover-up crisis did a lot to put an end to that states of life fallacy, reminding us that priests are also humans capable of great sin, but it lingers, you know? In part, this is due to our historical and theological myopia. We mistake the way things are for the way they've always been. Or we read into scripture more than is there, particularly when it comes to Jesus establishing the priesthood as, as it exists today. The causes, the causes of clericalism are historical, scriptural, and even psychological. But the effects of our clerical culture have been devastating, not just for lay people in the church, but for the clergy themselves. The first effect is the insularity of clerical culture. As an all-male institution with male hierarchs and decision-making roles, clergy are and remain accountable only to clergy. While parish councils and lay review boards exist, these are largely in an advisory capacity, which means that clerics are free to listen or ignore recommendations. There are exceedingly few examples where, of situations where lay people have the power, for example, to fire a priest. The insularity and monoculture of the priesthood breeds a kind of entitlement to which the laity no doubt contribute. What do I mean by entitlement? How many priests do their own laundry and cooking and cleaning? <laughs> yeah, giggle it out. It's true. Do we expect this from priests? Do we expect this from husbands? Why not? Are they not human beings? Are we? not human beings? Is someone sub or superhuman in this equation? Entitlement can operate in many ways, and we don't always experience it as the danger that it is. After all, even Vatican II encouraged the lady to support the mission of the church. And isn't helping father with meals or a cleaning lady or the like supporting the mission so he can focus on other things? But entitlement is dangerous, and entitlement coupled with insularity is particularly so. If we learned nothing else from the abuse crisis, if we continue to learn nothing else, it is that an insular, entitled class of persons cannot self-police. Our tendency toward self-protection and the economy of secrets, particularly sexual secrets, create a climate where the truth is sacrificed again and again. Consider, if all sexual sins are horrifically shameful and you know you have yours, how likely are you to expose those of the people you work with who might know your secret? Or, in a less insidious example, consider the notion of scandal. Our biggest problem in Roman Catholicism over the last 40 years, and I mean, I cannot say this emphatically enough, our biggest problem has been a profound misunderstanding of what might scandalize the faithful. Everhart puts it perfectly. Evil resides in the actions and inactions of people who fear the wrong thing who fear exposing evil when they should fear complicity with evil, who fear damage to reputation when they should fear, fear damage to the vulnerable, who fear the demands of pursuing justice 
when they should fear the consequences of not doing so. Where some people thought if lay people found out about pedophile priests that that would be a scandal, it turned out that the actual scandal was the massive cover-up that tried to prevent the truth from coming out. We thought that pedophiles would besmirch the church's good name, and they do, but not as much as watching the mechanisms of power circle up to protect them against the claims of survivors. We're consistently afraid of the wrong thing. We're afraid that the church is going to look bad, and that fear leads to decisions that make the church look worse. Moreover, we have a culture of sacrifice in the church. After all, it's almost Lent. We must be aware that our tendency to sacrifice should not apply to the truth, particularly the truth of violence against a vulnerable person. This lacked, la, the last effect of clericalism is something that applies broadly to many men in our culture, and it's Kate Mann's notion of empathy. You know I love a new word. And empathy is a great word. Empathy is the excessive sympathy we show to perpetrators of sexual violence, our reluctance to believe that people we know, people just like us, or people we trust, could be capable of monstrous acts. We need our monsters to look like monsters, in other words. And when they don't, when they look like people we've been taught to respect, we're far more likely to disbelieve an accusation than we are to hold a golden boy accountable. Empathy is a great word for a very old phenomenon. Look at McCarrick, look at Vanier, look at Maciel. This line from Mann is devastating in its accuracy, I think. The idea of rapists as monsters exonerates by caricature. Because these people don't seem like monsters, we refuse to believe that they are. Admitting that monsters look like everyone else gets us back to our original point, the terrifying, heart-stopping ubiquity the everydayness of sexual violation revealed in the Me Too movement and in its Church Too corollaries. It's easy, I think, to despair at this point, to look around at the amount of abuse and cover-up and sin and evil and throw up our hands in desperation. To look at our victim outreach or our lack thereof and recognize that we've decided on a ministry to survivors that Everhart correctly names a ministry of absence absence of safeguards, of recognition, of lament, of justice. To see how our empathy compounds victims' pain. So what can we do? I've only got time for one suggestion. I don't really know what time it is, but I'm confident that I'm running out. Oh yeah, ooh. So I've only got time for this one suggestion, but I think it's a good one. Believe women. <laughs> Imagine if we just did this. I don't mean believe all women regardless of countervailing evidence. I mean start from a position that women are trustworthy narrators of their own experience. It sounds so simple. And here's the kicker, it's biblical. <laughs> when I teach feminism and scripture to my students, um, they're always struck by the reality that women couldn't testify in court because a woman's testimony counted for nothing, right? It was automatically discounted. Oh, how they're shocked, shocked by this, right? It offends so many of their justice principles. But look around, for example, at Christine Blasey Ford's testimony. We routinely disbelieve women. When we talk about sexual assault, for example, in colleges where women are twice as likely to be sexually assaulted as they are to be robbed, I'll get a student every semester who says, yeah, but a lot of time girls are lying. Or the more insidious but no less disbelieving, what about due process questions? So here's the truth. Statistically, the amount of false rape reports is between 2 and 10%, which is the same rate as false larceny reports or other crimes. Victims are no more likely to lie about sexual assault than they are about robbery. Some of those 2 to 10% are baseless, which doesn't mean false, but rather not proven false. But fewer than 4 in 10 rapes are ever even reported. There's far more violence occurring than makes it to the authorities. Not that the authorities are that great when we, they receive a report anyway. So what would happen if we would believe women? Why shouldn't we believe them? Is it our desire to maintain social order? Let's look at what happened the last time a woman was telling the truth to upset the social order. This is from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other women went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and indeed is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said greetings and they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee there. They will see me. My colleague, New Testament scholar Claudia Setzer notes the anomaly that all four gospels make women the first witnesses to the resurrection, Mary Magdalene. On her word, the male disciples run to see the empty tomb. The gospel writers, had they wanted a stronger case, could have omitted Mary Magdalene if they wanted and just let men be the first to see the risen Christ, but they did not. Because of the evangelist's decision to leave Mary Magdalene in the story, Christians ran a huge risk of embarrassment. After all, the central claim of Christianity is predicated in all four accounts on the previously worthless testimony of a woman. So it would seem that Christians can be people who trust a woman's experience, what she has seen and heard. Perhaps then it's time to recover that aspect of the tradition and become a church that believes not only women, but if we're going to use that intersectional lens, we should work to believe all of those who are marginalized. That is how we will show what we've learned from Me Too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was a huge challenge, I think, just looking at all the different aspects that go into this, especially the trifecta of misogyny, secrecy, shame. And as a Dominican, Mary Magdalene certainly one of my heroes, and as the first preacher, as we mm -hmm. see it, especially first female preacher. I'm wondering, though, who are these other women that we should be looking to if Mary is not a great ideal, which I think we can talk about, but how, who else should we be looking to as the women who are the heroes in our tradition? That's a great question. Um, I have a lot of women heroes in the tradition. <laughs> um, I think of the four church women who were killed after being sexually assaulted in El Salvador. Um, Maura Clark is a hero of mine. Dorothy Day is a hero of mine. Um, but I also think that it's important that we not only rely on the kind of canon of saints for heroic women. I, I think of my grandmother <laughs> as a heroic Catholic woman, right, who came to this country, never spoke the language, worked in a factory, and now has you know a child or a grandchild with a PhD. That's pretty heroic. Um, I think of, uh, I was in a conversation this week with a nun, um, a black nun from Chicago, who we were talking about sort of speaking out on neuralgic issues and uh, it was sort of a fraught conversation and there's a lot of you know, questions and anxiety. And she just sort of said, you know, as Christians, aren't we called to risk everything? That's pretty heroic for me. So I think that um, rather than rely on, we have these paradigmatic figures and it's great, right? But too often we want that kind of heroic singularity. And in doing that, we miss the heroism that's going on in our own communities. And given the sort of prejudices and blind spots that lead to the can of saints looking the way that it does, I think it's incumbent especially upon marginalized groups like women and women of color and you know, people who are of different genders, et cetera, to look in their own communities for heroic virtue. But thank you, that's a really good question. Thank you for the talk. Uh, for many parts of the uh, lecture, I have some disagreements. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I think the, the reason we tabooing talking about sexuality is because sexuality is our very deep fundamental of our personality. Mm -hmm. It is very subtle, very sensitive part of who we are. And it is better not to talk 
to younger, younger people because it is only curiosity and it is very dangerous for them to know at earlier age. We'd better to let them know when they have better judgment, better reasoning, and better uh, ability to balance in between the consequences and their prompt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you, uh, you argued that <laughs> Uh, the reason the sexual abuser, abusers are on the red carpet is because we are uh, not talking about it. We are uh, we make it a secret to talk about uh, sexuality. But I think the biggest reason for the sexual abusers to uh, do that uh, sin is because they do not know what true love is. They think true love is um, achieving what they want, but the true love in definition is to desire the best thing for mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. That means their dignity, their uh, respecting their dignity, respecting who they are, re who they, really they are. So I think the tr uh, fundamental reason of Sexual abusers are a misunderstanding of tr uh, the definition of true love. And uh, you also said marriage couples, I mean, marriage opens the garage of uh, lust. <laughs> As a married per person, mm -hmm. I really highly uh, disagree with that. <laughs> oh, me, me too. That was an old definition. Like, it I was is, holding yeah. it up as a sort yeah. of. Yeah. yeah. Married couples also. <laughs> abstain from many uh, desires and they sacrifice a lot, as you know, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, right. So <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> agree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm glad that is, it is old definition. Yeah. And also, uh, uh, let me think. Yeah. So, and also you said, uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> the church uh, this great, uh, I mean, look down upon the body than soul, mm -hmm. but it is not true. <laughs> As many of you who know uh, Catholicism, we know that our body is not so inter 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 interfere, mm -hmm. in, I mean, soul is not superior than body. Our mm -hmm. body will rise up again when Jesus comes again on the last day and our body will be glorified and be united with our soul. And uh, how much glorified, it depends on how virtuous our life has been in this life. So mm -hmm. that's why we want to uh, nourish our body, nourish our soul, so that we can be glorified at the highest level. Mm -hmm. So I don't think church, uh, how can I say? The church does not um, look down upon the body than so than our soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. In general, I think uh, the main idea that sec uh, make it a secret of talking about sexuality is not the main reason for the sexual abusers. Mm -hmm. They just misunderstand what the true love is, mm -hmm. and they need to know that. Any, anyone should know that our sexuality is our dignity, our personality, very deep personality, and we should respect each other even though we are tempted to rob them mm -hmm. as our mm -hmm. own. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Those are very um, provocative questions. I have a couple of responses. First, on the matter of abuse as a perversion of true love. I think that that's part of it, but I don't want us to confuse sexual violation with something that it is not. It's not about lust or love, it's about power. Um, it's, a, it's an abuse of power, um, not a loss of control or a sort of overwhelming feeling of desire or something like that. It's, it's about domination. Um, and so we should be, especially in the case of abuse of children, we should be very clear that it is not, that love is not entering into the picture so much as an abuse of power. Um, I think that, that the point that you're making about, about our sexual lives as intimate and constitutive 
is interesting and important. Um, I do think that we are um, more private about our sex lives, but I think that there is a difference between secrecy and privacy. We all have a right to have our intimate lives be private, um, precisely because we want to guard them, because they are at the bedrock of some of our relationships, um, some of our most important relationships. I've been married for 20 years. Um, so we do want to keep that private, but secret is something else. Um, secrecy is it's enveloped in, in shame. Um, secret implies that if it gets out, something terrible will happen. And that's, that's a distinction that I want to hold as well. In terms of kids, I, I would love to not talk to my children about sex, but there are too many sexual predators out there to afford me that luxury. Um, and so I think that we all can find, I, like I'm obviously, I'm not sharing sexually explicit content with, you know, there's age appropriate ways to go about these things. But one of the most important things that we can do is talk about um, in the integrity of your body and how your body belongs to yourself. Um, that's not sex ed, right? Like we're not explaining the mechanics of sexual intercourse to young children, but we are explaining, right? Like even when my children were very little, you know, you do this exercise where you touch a baby on the face and you say, whose face is this? This is your face, your face. And whose hand is this? This is your hand, your hand, your body. This belongs to you. Right? And there are all kinds of ways that we can train children and talk to children about the integrity of their bodies, about the difference between secrecy and privacy, about who, whose secrets they should keep and whose they should never keep, um, that, will, that can set up guardrails, because, precisely because our sexual identities are so um, precious to us, the fact that they can be violated and that our fundamental human dignity can be violated so easily is, I think, what compels us to have more forthright conversations about sex and sexuality with our children. It is precisely because they develop curiosity or are constantly exposed to sexualized imagery um, you know, in ways that we might not even know sometimes, whether at school or through social media or through YouTube or whatever, that we need to be on our, on our guard, not by putting our children in a bubble, because that's, I mean, you know, there's no point, but by equipping them with a language that's appropriate, developmentally appropriate and age appropriate language, but nevertheless, right, um, not talking about it and avoiding it just heaps more, you know, well, what must this be? It must be really something very bad if nobody's talking about it. Oh my God, I better never say anything. That's a kind of um, a dangerous place to put your kids in. And this is where the work of Emily Reimer Berry, um, who's a moral theologian out at Santa Clara, her work on the way we catechize young children, especially about obedience to authority and the secrecy of the confessional. Secrecy in, in children is a profoundly difficult topic and one that, that we need to be very nuanced about how we approach with kids. Um, so like, you know, even grandparents, I, I did this with my mom, she didn't, my mom's Cuban, you know, she didn't, she didn't get it, and it's fine. It's like, you, if, even if you give them like cake for dinner, just don't tell them to keep it a secret from me, <laughs> right? It's so tempting to be like, oh, this will be our little secret, you know, I'm gonna buy you this candy bar. Don't do that, right? Because it sets up a paradigm where we're in on something and you don't tell your parents. And that leads to a kind of divided loyalty and a sort of feeling of obligation and a nervousness. And it doesn't need to be that way, right? Just, you won't get in trouble, just tell me. And that, those kind of open lines of communication are, I think, an important step in protecting um, our children that we have not been quite able to do without that, those forthright conversations. You can all come. Come on. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I think I follow you on Twitter. Oh but, my God! Sorry. Yeah. No. I, <laughs> I, I, anyways, um, I so I, I'm also Jesuit educated. I went to Gonzaga, and uh, I'm now I'm at the Divinity School here, and I've been thinking a lot about um, just the way that seminarians are formed. And I know um, at Gonzaga we had uh, our own scandal of uh, several years of credibly accused priests. Um, and we've housed them in our Bay House, and then now I think being in seminary, I've seen power dynamics play out in real time, which is uh, not, it's, yeah, not fun. Um, so I guess I'm thinking about what the role of a seminary is, even if it is ecumenical, mm -hmm. how we can um, 
create accountability in those spaces so it yeah. doesn't escalate to an abuse crisis. Yeah, that's really difficult. Um, and and I think, sorry, big question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah. Um, and I think part of it is that there's so many different um, yeah. institutions that are called seminaries and places yes. where seminarians get formed, right? Totally. Catholic seminarians get formed in diocesan seminaries, but religious seminarians get formed in universities mm -hmm. many times. And there's a difference there. Um, one is co-education, mm -hmm. right? There is something about being in class with lay women mm -hmm. and you know non-binary persons that allows for those bonds of friendship and so for the other to become real in a way. Like I've, I've been in a number of situations where I've walked out and like my husband and I went to graduate school together. He's also a theologian. Mm -hmm. I've just been like, it's too bad that person never sat in a theology class and just like a girl answered better. <laughs> because that experience would have really helped. I think that homily <laughs> experience would have helped that homily a lot. Um, so I think that that's, that's one of the things, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the, the communal experience, and I understand the temptation to pull seminarians away from the general population yeah. and to kind of keep them protected or protect their time or whatever, protect their vocation, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. But I think that living in community with, in a mixed community, ecumenical community, um, co-educational communities, et cetera, really sort of helps ground um, and integrate a person's whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's one way. It's been a long time since I've been um, in formation like that, and I don't teach graduate students at this point in my career, but, but yeah, I think that that's part of it. I think it's about diversifying the community of learning, of learners, and of teachers. Um, yes. And diocesans and seminaries certainly don't have that necessarily. And that's, Thanks. you know, it's, it impoverishes the church, you know. But thank you. That's that's a really tough question. Oh, sorry, yeah. No. Over Twitter. So. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Come back at me over Twitter. It's fine. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So it seems like some of the things, and please correct me if I misunderstood any of this, um, that you were sort of critical of, like purity culture, um, obedience, um, you know, certain differences between men and women, complementarity. Um, you know, saving sexual, the fullness of sexual expression for marriage. It seems like many of these are not corruptions, but genuine expressions of the Christian tradition. And so, and so my question is, in, in what sense can we, in what way can we, we reject these things? Um, or, or maybe if, if, and please correct me if I misunderstand you, but in what way could we, we, could we reject these without rejecting the, the fullness of the Christian tradition? Thank you for that. Um, I think that, that you are pointing to um, the problem of the dynamism of the tradition. <laughs> um, the tradition, or with the capital T tradition, which I think is what you're referencing, right? The capital T tradition of the church, right? Not the little T traditions like Ash Wednesday right, yeah, the ashes, well, yeah. the, that's the little T, right, what, the big T tradition, the big kind of moral teaching, sure. the magisterium, that kind of thing. Um, I don't see that as, as static as we might um, characterize it. Uh, I think of usury, for example, which was once seen to be not a corruption, but a genuine expression of the Christian tradition that we have left behind after some study after some consultation with business people, we decided to leave that aspect of the tradition behind when we saw that it was doing more harm than good. So I wonder if, in the case of the sexual abuse crisis specifically, enough harm has been done that we should reevaluate some aspects of the big T tradition. This is not to say that I think that we should become a church of sexual libertines where anything and everything goes at all times. That, that doesn't lead to happiness either, or justice. But the clericalist, shame-filled, secrecy-ridden way we've set up sexual morality now has not led us to good places. So I just, 
I think it's two things. Number one, I, don't, I just don't see the tradition as entirely or remotely static. I, I think it's changing all the time. Um, all the time. Don't you? Do you, do you see this, the tradition changing in any ways? Well, I, yeah, I understand what you mean, but it seems like there needs to be some sort of clear principles upon which we evaluate tradition. And, and, and um, so I guess that's what I'm sort of looking for. Uh, in, on what, what sort of principles do, do we evaluate um, tradition? I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, one would be the full human flourishing of men and women. The desire for justice, the care for the poor. That's three that I would use. <laughs> and then after that, I mean, you know, there's a lot that can come from that. But I think that if we start from those places rather than from the penitentials, which we've moved away from, I'd like to point out, in our social teaching, right? We've moved from acts based to more of a perspectivist approach. If we can do it with the social teaching, we can do it with the sexual teaching. If we can allow for well-formed consciences in one, we can allow for well-formed consciences in the other. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I know it's making you uncomfortable. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Though. <laughs> All right. Sorry, so kind of on that. Hi, line. Paul. Hi. Um, <laughs> thanks. That was a very entertaining and very enlightening talk. Um, and I just wanted to ask on the dynamism point, mm -hmm. kind of like a two part question. But the first part is like, how useful do you think it is in these conversations to point back, like you did? It's like old versions of what marriage is defined as. But a lot of people today are really like, ooh, that's not what I think of as marriage, as like a way to open up the door to conversations. So mm -hmm. that's my first question is like, how could history be helpful, not just oppressive? Right. And then the second thing is, Things some some of the dynamism, especially in the last like twenty years, is like seems to be going like up like usually the, the other way a little bit, and from mm -hmm. where this conversation is going, and I'm kind of wondering what you might describe as the reason for mm -hmm. why some people are are feeling like they need to go back to pr other principles, older principles, and how we might deal with that. Yeah, I think thank you for those. That's really good. There is a lot of anxiety, um, right? A lot of anxiety about change, especially social change. And with that anxiety comes a desire for the quote unquote simpler time, <laughs> right? Uh, the simpler time, which was never as simple as we think, right? We think of the simpler 1950s, but we never think about civil rights at that time. Um, we think about, you know, I don't know, all kinds of simpler things that were not really simple for the people who were living through it. So part of that is not knowing the nuance of it. And that's one of the usefulness, that's one of the useful things about looking back at history. When you, th when you talk about, <laughs> Um, so one of the things I talk about a lot that really freaks people out, and I apologize already because I know some of you will be freaked out by this, is the spousal metaphor for the church, right? The spousal metaphor, the Christ and the church, and the church is the bride, and Christ is the bridegroom. And when we talk about this in class, I usually talk about, like, what, what was first century marriage like? Because it wasn't, you know, romantic, and it wasn't, you know, <laughs> like, white dresses and aisles and dad giving you away and... No, it was very much a, a hierarchy of power where women had zero and men had all. That's why the metaphor works, because Christ has power and authority and the church is subject. That's the metaphor. And so if you're thinking the spousal metaphor as something really like, you know, like anything like contemporary marriage, you're violating one of the initial and probably the cornerstone of that metaphor, which is the superiority or the authority of Christ over the church. So... To invoke the spousal metaphor in a 21st century mind, right? unless we start thinking about these older versions of marriage, we're A, missing a huge chunk of the metaphor, right? because we think it's so, so, oh my god, Jesus loves me like my husband loves me. That's so beautiful. Yes, but that's not what that metaphor means. Jesus isn't doing the dishes here <laughs> right? at all. This isn't a, it's not a marriage of equals. It cannot be. right? That's not the metaphor. Um, so I think it's nice to, to have these ideas and to look at, you know, to look at Aquinas calling women defective males and to look at Tertullian saying that all of us are de the devil's gateway. That's important because it shows, A, the dynamism of the tradition, right? What we once believed fervently could never change, we dropped but quick once we realized that it was an affront to human dignity. And that the church is capable of change, resilience, and thriving and has been throughout the church's history. And I take great hope from that. 
right? We, it is normal for us to feel anxiety, and I don't think we feel any more anxiety than the people in the 60s when mass completely changed, right? That was probably very angst-ridden for them. <laughs> this, okay, but, you know, every Sunday isn't a, an earthquake, right? <laughs> So we do feel anxiety. It is normal to feel anxiety about social change. It is especially normal if you stand to lose in that social order. So, you know, people generally at the top of the gender paradigm or the racial paradigm or the economic paradigm feel an acute anxiety about this. And that's okay. The Holy Spirit, I think, is a little bit more resilient than that, right? And that's where you sort of throw yourself on the, the indefectibility of the church or where I do, anyway. But thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Imperatore Lee, for such a challenging conversation and engagement about Me Too and the opportunities for learning and growth in the church as we look to the future. I invite everyone to please join us on April 24th for the Golden Fellowship in Faith and Science with Dr. Stephen Barr. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.